Um, thanks again for having me. Uh, uh, I, you know, my name is Tyler Goss. I'm the Global Innovation Development Manager at Turner Construction. Uh, beside that being a lot of syllables, what it means is that I, get, I just sort of get to be in charge of a lot of the cool, cutting edge, innovative stuff that we're doing at, uh, at Turner. Um, you know, from from BIM technologies to our lean practices to, and really, at the end of the day, what it comes down to is, uh, you know, our in charge of organizational change, culture change at Turner. Um, and so I think my, my slides are not showing up for some reason. Um, is that me here? Let's try this again. Do, 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 do. Hmm. So, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just continue to, to talk. Uh, the only thing you'd see up there is the Turner Innovation logo. So uh, we'll just go ahead and talk. So I think that you know the normal expectation when you come to something like this and you're from a company like Turner is you know that I, I I'm supposed to get up here and cherry pick a few really high performing projects and show how we're using leading edge technology and uh, you know on these limited real edge cases the really the biggest and, and brightest projects and and then leave you with the impression that Turner is light years ahead of the competition and the U S is light years ahead of. Australia, you know, and will create fear and some doubt that will obviously inspire you to go and buy the latest products from uh, the vendors that are out there in the hall. Um, and and it's, you know, it's not exactly what I want to do today. Um, you know, the, the you know, it's that narrative is just simply not true, right? Uh, more specifically, the, the act of innovating within a huge construction firm, act of changing a huge construction firm, is really frustrating, really complex, and really annoying work, and we often don't get it right at all. So what I want to do today is talk a little bit more about where we've failed, um, where we've had successes, where we've had failures, and what we've learned in that process. So I want to you know, spend a few minutes looking back at the changes we've tried to make here uh, Turner in the past 10 years, and why I think those specific changes have helped us as a, as a company. But you know, more importantly, what I really want to talk about very critically uh, is about what those changes and those systems of change seem to suggest about the future of delivering buildings, both in the states and, and worldwide. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, for those of us, who, you know, for those of you who know me, and there's some people in the room that know me, um, you know, I, I want to say that that uh, I want to say that something here with my notes. <laughs> Um, uh, I want to suggest that in order for us and for everyone in this room and for all of our colleagues and, and, and everyone else in the industry to continue to deliver great buildings and create value for our customers and really reap the financial rewards that we're obviously owed, um, we're going to need to affect really radical changes in how we execute uh, the work of design, the work of engineering, and the work of construction. Uh, and I'm not talking about some of the superficial changes we've seen to technological instrumentation like BIM uh, that we're familiar with, or sort of incremental improvements to uh, uh, our processes, but real like fundamental uh, 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 crazy changes like, like to the way that we are actually collaborating through the supply chain, uh, the what kind of intelligence we make into our models and and, and designs, uh, and and just the, the fundamental basis of how we the, the people and the skill sets that we bring to bear uh, on the problem of construction. Um, or, how are we doing? Is it me? Is it my laptop? Um, it shouldn't be. It wasn't even working. Okay. It's yeah. Um, so that being said, I, I kind of want to you know even raise the stakes a bit further. Um, you know, we've had moments of change, moments of if, moments of inflection in the industry, and where things are you know in flux and changing uh, throughout the last hundred years. And and but I think that there's something different about today. I think that the, you know these big crazy crazy changes that are coming to the industry. Uh, you know, they're there aren't they aren't needed merely to create a more productive and more profitable and AEC sector, but. I think we actually need to change as an industry and, and as the incumbents in this industry, we need to change in order to meet some really serious existential threats we're seeing from the outside, from the world of tech, from the world of, of uh, from uh, uh, outside of, of us as an industry. Oh, All right, it's up there now. Ominous pause for a fact. That was a very long ominous pause over there. Um, all right, so let me just go back to where I was, right? So. You know, before I get to the part we just talked about, which is where we're, none of us have a job a decade from now, um, I want to talk about what innovation means to a company like Turner. I want to, you know, what it means today, what it's meant to us in the past, 
uh, what I hope it would mean to us in the future. And, and I want to talk about this uh, really rigorously and in, in sort of as systemic and philosophical level as I can. So let's start with what I do every day uh, uh, and what, what I, I'm very lucky I don't get fired for doing. And uh, I'm going to ask a big, dumb question. Um, so I'm pretty confident that the vast majority of people, firms represented here today, you're probably currently at or near or over 100% resource allocation. You're probably profitable. You've probably got comfortable backlogs. I've seen the number of cranes that are up in Melbourne. I, I've seen the number of cranes that are up in Sydney. It's, there's a lot of work going on, right? So as long as we are meeting our clients' expectations and we're delivering value in accordance with historical expectations, right, uh, and doing it profitably, what, is there any real reason that we have to change, right? So uh, certainly Turner doesn't have a real market-driven need to change, right? We're the largest general building in the United States. We grew our construction volume by 20% in the last three years. We're forecasting nearly 50% more backlog, about $18 billion going into our next fiscal year. So I think the most important thing to do right now is ask, uh, you know, why change, right? Stupid, of course we need to change, right? Everyone here up here today is telling you you need to change, right? Uh, otherwise, there's no reason that we all spent the money to come here to Melbourne to talk about it, right? But I'm a skeptic by nature, you know, and, and, and I'm not entirely convinced we do need to change, right? Especially when that change, when the need to change, and I'm gonna get in a little trouble here because this is being recorded, um, and when the need to change is being championed solely by those who have a very obvious dog in the hunt. Right? We're still, for the most part, designing and delivering decent buildings that suit our customers' varied needs, and we're doing it on time and on budget. But, and, and this is a big but, uh, that's only when we measure ourselves against the severely diminished expectations of a generally unsophisticated customer uh, bound to a highly competitive but historically complacent marketplace. Right? Sounds like construction, right? Um, what I'm essentially saying um, and is that when everyone else sucks as much as everyone else, there's really no value for us in being the best builders we can be. So we often just settle for being marginally better than the guy down the street, right? What's well, the old maxim? I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be faster than you, right? Uh, to this day, it's often hard to convince our people and our collaborators, our competitors, our trade partners, everyone, and our customers even, that we really do need to improve on anything, right? So. What then is the purpose of having an innovation director or innovation manager at a company like Turner, right? So let me back up a second here and talk about the word innovation because it's a really tricky and slippery word, right? And it's become a real suitcase word. Like people jam all sorts of different meanings into it until we lose all connection between the word and significance. And, and I think this, this activity around the word is, actually, word is actually a good indication of how important the word has become. So let's start by defining what innovation means at Turner. So first off, in order for something to be considered innovative at Turner, we believe it must fundamentally change the basis of performance of our work, right? That is to say, it has to allow us to accomplish something that would have been previously impossible, right? Secondly, it's gotta provide, provide sustained value to Turner, our customers, our industry, and perhaps most importantly, society at large, right? Uh, and for me, this is really important. Uh, it's personally important to me. It's also, and I think we just talked about that, you know, you know changing the world, right? Changing the world through the built environment. Um, if all we're doing is using innovation to differentiate from our competition and beat them in the marketplace, we're not making the industry or built environment a better place. Just not happening. And I really like the quote work that you opened with, you know, today, the, the, in order to succeed and move the industry forward, we have to find new ways to collaborate, new ways to, to share and collectively improve our standing, right? And as I said before, I don't think the question why change is settled. Um, I, more specifically, I don't think we spend enough time honestly examining the motivations that underpin our desire to change or most people not to change um, uh, for that matter. Uh, but for us at Turner, the answer is pretty simple. It's that, right? Because we want to be a better company today than we were yesterday, right? And, and, and you notice in there, I don't want to be better than my competition. I just want to be better than I was yesterday because I was, you know, we were okay yesterday. We can be better today. We can be improving every single day, right? At the end of the day, we do this because it makes us a better company. And every other benefit, profitability, more work, better buildings, customer reputation, market performance, uh, flows from that. So when we think about innovation and change at Turner, this is what we really mean. Um, and so as we think of any narrative about innovation and change, it starts with the first step. The first step is admitting you have a problem. Um, so 10 years ago, our problem, the problem that drove both the level of value we provide to our customers and our own resultant profitability was rework. Right? Rework had and has a number of preceding factors. We all know these things. We talk about these things all the time. 
Um, but the easiest intervention at that particular juncture in history for us back in 2007, 2008, was to adopt a BIM-driven coordination methodology. This was, unsurprisingly, a pretty big technological hurdle for our folks in, in New York, for our trades in New York. But we decided we'd jump in and tackle it, and we started with one of our largest and most complex projects to date, Yankee Stadium. Right? The baseball stadium in New York City, a billion dollar project um, for the uh, New York Yankees, the, the reviled or the revered New York Yankees, depending on where you're from. Uh, I go with the reviled. Um, uh, uh, there's got to be like a footy team that, that, that's the equivalent of the Yankees, the, the ones who win every year and, and no one likes except for their fans. Okay, they're all, okay, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's different though, isn't that? That's, okay. Um, so we decided at the time we would deliver the entire, you know, this is, this is a billion dollar project in 2009, deliver the entire major trade coordination process in a 3D, what I would call proto-BIM environment, geometric environment, not necessarily a parametric or metadata environment. And this is a bit of a problem, right, is the trade contractors in New York were pretty much unskilled with the new technology and they just did not want to adopt it at all. They didn't want to have anything to do with it, um, seeing it as a risk, it's change, it was going to erode their profits, et cetera. Um, so we took the risk on for them, right? To, in order to mitigate that risk, we, we took on the cost of training and implementing the BIM process with our trades. Um, you know, the, 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 the contract community, the results were so positive. That our, just as an example, our plumbing contractor uh, saw an 85% reduction in on-site material waste and rework, right? And you know, he bought a Maserati and he, and he loves us to this day because he made so much money on this job. Um, but they became our fiercest allies in the effort to expand VDC coordination in New York. Just, and so we, we learned from that that you know, you, you can, if, we are, if we have conviction in our hypothesis, if we believe that our hypothesis is true, we're going to spend the money to get everyone to come along with us. You know? And so over the last 10 years, we've gone from 3D coordination as a unique solution for our really complex projects to where we are today which is 71% you know, of our work right now is managed through VDC processes, and that's coordination, that's sequencing, that's estimating, logistics, um, a wide range of things, and again, tailored to each individual project, right? Um, and this has had a huge effect at the enterprise level for us. Our BIM-enabled projects are significantly more profitable, uh, which means in turn that we're likely to deliver them on time and on budget, right? Um, but it, interestingly though, the, so that 71% number, you know, you're thinking, okay, we're, we're we got we got to keep going, right? But the last few years, that number's been pretty stable. Um, probably because I'm not doing my job, but maybe it's something else, right? And of course, me being you know me, I'm thinking maybe there's something else. Uh, while I'd love to see the number go up, I also want to be mindful we don't fall into the trap. And I think I see this a lot is the trap of solutioneering, <coughs> right? If we could just get that perfect BIM model, right? So the theory goes, we'd have perfect foresight. All of our problems would melt away, and we could just go ahead and get on with the work, and, and it would be perfect, right? No more problems. It all just, it's frictionless and beautiful, right? But at the end of the day, BIM is a solution. As a solution, it's, it's a solution that works very well for a specific subset of industry problems that are pliant to analysis, right? Whether that's analysis is manual or computational, doesn't matter. <coughs> These problems quickly emerge as the low-hanging fruit, right? The coordination, sequencing, estimating, things that you can, you can that math, things that are counting. Uh, but as we go up to the more difficult problems, we have to be careful not to artificially limit the range of potential solutions we have, right? This is the classic uh, uh, maximum of the hammer. If, you, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every, every problem looks like a nail, right? So our early successes in BIM really led us to refocus our research and experimentation. And this was probably a mistake at the time and, and it was one of the things we learned from is, you know, we said, well, what else can we do with BIM? What are the other applications of data-centric building information management? Um, and so one thing we started to study back in 2011 is something that, that, that Malcolm was talking about today. Um, I don't know if this is running yet. Let's see. Nope. Okay, the video is not running. Hmm. The video is not running. All right, well, we'll leave it up there. Um, so we looked at uh, robust BIM platforms for facilities and asset management solutions, right? This is a platform we built for Columbia University, and I'll walk, I'll talk through it instead of uh, seeing, watching through it. Um, it says builds remaining one, so you'd think it would be, no? Okay. Um, so we're working with a startup called M6. We wrote some custom code. We connected the building uh, systems to a BIM environment, right? We, Basically, when this thing went live, we had over 1,000 pieces of equipment streaming 5,000 data points uh, uh, on their operational status every minute. 
And this we believed, uh, our hypothesis at the time, was that this would allow the facility to be managed more efficiently and optimally, right? So we built the system out, set it up, trained the FM team on how to use it, and turned it on. And unsurprisingly, 2011, they just said, they just abandoned it immediately. It was too complex and too hard to use and to effectively to improve their decisions and management. So this led us to a conclusion, which you've already seen. Let's look for problems, not for solutions, right? It, while we could provide a robust FM solution at the time in 2011, there was really no customer value in doing so, right? At least in 2011 and at least with that team. We had forgotten to ask the key question, which was, and I think Malcolm mentioned this earlier, what, you know, we'd go to the customer, ask them, what can we give you that will make your job easier? We'd forgotten to tie our innovation to the value it provided to the customer. All that being said, though, the profoundly interesting outcome of our BIM and VDC implementation at Turner is this. It really surfaced a number of other places where we sucked at our jobs, right? Which is pretty obvious when you think about it, right? The, the work of building, design, delivery, is an immensely complex set of informational transactions and decisions. When we make one area of that network more effective and efficient, it exposes all of those other nodes of that network that have to, you know, to, to belabor the, the analogy, that they have more latency and therefore more waste, right? So, our use of BIM accidentally exposed waste and problems in our delivery process, right? So building on this, we hypothesized that if we instead built a system to intentionally uncover and mitigate systemic waste, we'd be able to accelerate this process of improvement and innovation, right? And that gets us to lean transformation. Um, I think a lot has been, uh, ink has been spilled lately uh, on lean construction and, and uh, you know, the, the tools of lean construction. I wanna say that uh, we don't like to think of ourselves, and I, I hope we're, we're trying not to think of ourselves as a uh, construction company that does lean. We want to be a lean organization that does construction. Um, so, you know, the, 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 you know, you think about it, lean comes out of the manufacturing world, right? There are some very fundamental systemic differences between manufacturing world and construction, right? We build 1,400, 1,500 projects a year. Every single one of them is bespoke. It's unique. It's never going to be done again. It's not even a prototype. It's just we're going to do it once and we're going to move on, right? Um, but, you know, there are still, and I think I talked about this last night at dinner, there's still some, there are systemic inefficiencies, right, that, that we can deploy the tools and philosophy of lean construction on top of this BIM infrastructure. And, and we do this and we've done this under the hypothesis that if we give our 8,500 coworkers uh, the skills to not only solve unique problems they face every day, but root cause problems in our overall delivery process, we should see a marked improvement in these processes, and that should also unearth other common cause problems that you know, can be solved with further changes and innovations. And essentially, you know, it's just, this is a you know, silly diagram, and I apologize, the world of lean has terrible diagrams, um, and this is another one of them. I wish I could make them better, but I am limited in my, my skill set. Um, <laughs> You know, it's the idea we want to, you know, take where we are today, break through this limit line, break through uh, our, what we know and our, our ability uh, to perform and start to perform at a higher level. Um, then to put it very simply, lean management for us is a set of routines that leverage scientific thinking and deliberate practice to achieve seemingly unattainable goals, right? Uh, breaking through our current limitations and providing higher value for our customers. And we've formalized this belief in our lean transformation framework, again, the graphics in this world are silly. Um, so at the top of this is what we call our situational approach, right? This is, comprises both the central problem we we're trying to solve, we want to maximize customer value, um, and the tools we're, we're deploying to solve it. And we'll talk a bit about those tools in a bit. You know, and, uh, we're, we strive to solve this problem through an effort, you know, this, these are the pillars, right? Uh, how we, uh, essentially, uh, uh, we want to continuously improve our work and our process. Uh, we also want to develop the skills and the instincts of our staff to identify and solve problems at every level of the company as well, right? And ultimately, all of this is, is founded on principles of scientific thinking. Um, uh, you know, we want to be compelled to rigorously pursue empirical, measurable, and observable data that verifies or nullifies our hypotheses about how we can be better. Um, and I think one of the things that is the hardest thing to grasp about the process of innovation, improvement, or, or, or lean thinking is that this is not a linear process, right? You, you, you're, there's a lot of failure between two and three. You're gonna test things, they're not gonna work. Um, I always, the example I always use here is what I pull from outside of the industry and I talk about SpaceX, right? Um, uh, uh, for years and years and years, everyone knew that, the, oh, that you had to have a disposable first stage to a rocket that went to orbit, right? It had, it had to fall in the ocean, there's nothing you do. 
Along comes Elon Musk. He says, okay, we're going to figure out how to land a rocket on the ocean, right? And they, they put a barge out there. They did some testing. They had the retro rockets fire, and they failed, I think, seven or eight times. But every time they failed, they learned something about the limits of what they could do, and they improved their systems. They improved their, their hardware. They improved their software. Uh, it eventually got to the point where now they can land uh, a, a rocket on a barge in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and that changes the basis of performance for space travel. Just amazing, right? Um, you know, it, it's not, scientific experimentation is not easy. It doesn't come naturally. It's, you know, while change is, you know, I've got a, a friend who's a venture capitalist. He's, his favorite saying is, innovation is the fundamental human vocation, right? But we're not actually that good at affecting uh, systemic change, right? And when it comes to lean, this is because some of the fundamental concepts are deceptively counterintuitive. Uh, you take the concept of pull, for, for example, right? Um, pull systems operate completely backwards from the way that we've been trained to think, right? We're, we're, we're trained to think of work flowing from raw materials to the building, right? But, uh, uh, you know, when you think about pull, the value is actually flowing backwards. It's flowing from the owner all the way back through the supply chain. They're, they're pulling the work to, you know, to it. And, and it's, it's the difference between ASAP and just in time. And, you know, because I'm in Australia, I say it's, it's kind of like trying to learn to drive on the wrong side of the road after 25 years of driving on the correct side like we do in the States. Um, so in order to teach the principle of pull at, at Turner, we've, we've, uh, we, we want to make it so routine for our people that it changes their mindset. And, and what we've been doing is we've been implementing uh, this system called the Last Planner System. Is anyone here familiar with the Last Planner System? Okay, so a few, yeah. So it, it, it's a set of tools uh, at a different set of scales. Uh, it's a tools and routines that are designed to establish pull and seek perfection in the planning, scheduling, and sequencing of construction work, right? Uh, we start by collaboratively, collaboratively establishing a uh, phase plan, right? What are we going to do between these two milestones of the project? We work with our trade partners. It's, it's, it's a, a physical process. It's a, it's a collaborative process that happens in a room together. Sometimes we do it remotely. We like to do it in a room. Um, we then establish a six-week look-ahead plan, right? We break down, we break down all, the, all the tasks, and we understand what we're going to be doing over the next six weeks in the project. We make that visible to everyone. We then break that down into a weekly work plan where we have specific tasks that are going to happen over the course of that week. Uh, and then we huddle every day to make sure that we're on plan and we're tracking, right? And, and the goal of this is not, when we started doing this, we thought, well, the goal is to optimize. The goal is to improve efficiency. It's to deliver the projects faster. It's really not. It's, it's to improve predictability, right? We actually will punish, well, it, it's not punish because uh, we don't do that, but, you know, we, we will, you know, the, the whole point of, of this is to, to establish reliable times for things finishing, right? I don't want to finish early. I don't want to finish late. I want to finish when I've promised to finish the work, right? So I'll take a little detour. And this is something I talked about last night and I've been thinking about a bit. I'll take a little detour into CPM scheduling and, and logic here for a second. At Turner, um, our typical reliability for performing a, a task on our CPM, on our critical path, uh, where it ends on the day we say it's going to end, about 35-40%, right? Incredibly unpredictable. Like, it's going to be early, it's going to be late. You know, and then you think about it, you've got 150 items on, this, on the critical path, then you're, you know, if the math of that is you take 30.35 and you multiply it by 0.35 and you multiply it by 0.35 and, and so on and so forth and so on. And you know, the, if you multiply that all out, the chances of you actually finishing a project on time and, and are nil, no, there's zero. There's close to zero. It's, you know, it's like, you know, uh, the chances of you doing it is like the chances of finding a particular hydrogen atom somewhere in the, the, uh, in the Andromeda uh, uh, galaxy. Um, so in CPM, we introduce float and we introduce buffers and we do these things to say, okay, I think it's good, you know, you, you still have to pick a, an end date, but it's theater. Uh, and, and you say, okay, we're going to do, we, we think it's going to take us five days to do this, but it might take us 10. So it's going to be a 10, 10 uh, day project. Now that introduces distrust and, and, and unreliability in the process. So, you know, if, if you're the mechanical contractor and you say it's going to take 10 days, I need the floor for 10 days, it takes you six, and then it's empty, you know, and the electrical doesn't, can't come in until the next Monday, uh, everyone, no one's going to want to talk to each other, no one's going to want to tell each other the truth about what's actually happening on the project. Um, and, you know, this is, this is what we see when we do Last Planner, is we start out, this is a project in, in San Francisco where we started Last Planner here in April of 2015. We didn't do it at the beginning. We were having trouble. Um, and as we did it, we, we stayed, you know, relative, this is our plan percent complete, basically the tasks that we 
said we were going to do during that week that we actually accomplished. 47%, 48%, 48%, right? Um, but as you see, as we start to get along into the process, the team started to trust each other. They started telling each other the truth about what they were going to be able to do. They started making reliable promises to each other. We ended up at you know, around 85 90% for, for, of plan percent complete for the project. Right? So this is emblematic of what we've learned about last planning implementation. We, you know, uh, uh, we shaved 71 workdays off the schedule for this project. And again, we did that without any technology. <laughs> that was just people in a room working, working it out together and trusting each other. Um, 71 days, three months, that was about a million dollars in mobilization cost for us. You know, and then, and that, that all went back to the owner. So you know, the lesson we learned there, predictability, not productivity, is everything. What's great for us about lean management in Last Planner isn't that it optimizes productivity or reduces waste, although it did do these things, but that it increases reliability uh, and predictability during the process, and, and which reduced risk for us and it reduced risk for our trade partners, and it delivers the project more, more predictably. And like with BIM, our lean journey has exposed other opportunities for improvement across our supply chain, uh, one of which is I'm going to talk about next, um, modular prefabrication, and I think in a broader sense, industrialized construction. We started to dip our toe in this world through the process of designing, delivering modular bathroom pods on major hospital projects in Ohio and Tennessee. And, and due to the scale and, and scope of uh, the repetitive nature of hospital design, and also the appetite for lean improvement within our healthcare clients, uh, these projects became the perfect test platform for this technique. <clears throat> We've now expanded our use of bathroom pods beyond healthcare and into the adjacent sectors of hospitality and residential construction. And we've noticed a few key things about them uh, in, in doing that. First of all, they require a much higher degree of upfront coordination and management of construction tolerance, tolerances for the adjacent trades and materials. Uh, uh, in most cases, in order to install them according to ADA code or the American Dis uh, Disability Act code, um, we need to depress the slabs underneath the bathrooms, which represents cost and schedule impacts to our, our concrete, con you know, concrete fabricators. Um, finally, we need to take every opportunity in the factory to simplify assembly, uh, and we want to hear as much as possible the modular dimensions of the materials we're using, no waste, right? And all these factors combine to make this approach economically viable only when we're producing a couple hundred of them at a time, uh, which puts them beyond the reach of all but our biggest projects. So I said I was going to retroactively reconstruct a narrative here of, of innovation at Turner. Um, you know, clearly the implications uh, of 3D coordination, lean process improvement, and modular prefabrication, they all overlap in complex and non-narrative and ahistorical ways. Uh, but as a company, we started thinking about these innovations as steps towards a projected better future for the industry. Mind you, I don't think the overall industry's current trajectory is going to take us to this future that I'm imagining. Uh, it's going to take significant effort and pain and capital to bend the curve towards this potential future. But the, one, the future I do want to see is one that relies on greater industrialization and vertical integration of our delivery process, one that allows the individual engineers and architects and builders to be more effective and more productive and go home happy at the end of the day and provide future generations with a better built, built environment. Right? And I don't think it's clear that we, as the architects, engineers, and contractors who comprise the industry's incumbents, uh, have sole claim to this projected future, which should be kind of chilling to anyone who wants to continue with business as usual. Right? Um, before we go too deep in this idealized future, let's talk about the past a bit. Um, yep. So the argument is not a new idea, right? The argument that we should essentially build buildings like we build cars, um, it's an obvious enough statement. It's, you know, manufacturing, starting with the automotive sector, saw these productivity gains. Doug talked about it this morning. Um, you know, over that same period of construction, you know, for a number of reasons that we all know, uh, uh, hasn't really changed, right? Um, we've resisted these changes despite countless opportunities to impart in an industrialized methodology in the real estate sector. Uh, and I don't think I need to re rehearse the history of modular prefabrication and industrialized construction for this audience, right? You know, it's been around for a long time. You know, Crystal Palace, Sears, prefabricated homes, Levittown, the Eames uh, house in, in Los Angeles. Um, I think that, that for the past century, modular has been consistently five years away from mass adoption. Like everyone's always saying, it's going to be it's right around the corner. We're going to do it, you know. But I do. So I wanted to talk about a couple of recent projects uh, to close out today that we've done at Turner because I think they're illustrative of where prefabrication has shown some success, but also where it's failed completely spectacularly, and what that might mean for the future. Um, this is Bing Concert Hall in Stanford at Stanford University in uh, Palo Alto, California. 
Um, as an educational and cultural facility, we were under real tight schedule pressure to deliver the completed building by the start of the school year, which actually created a real problem with the, uh, for one component in the auditorium, which were these wood audience walls. And these were being, well, specifically, we had to meet a half inch tolerance uh, in two dimensions uh, where the wall attached to the concrete structure, right? This is why we don't like architects, Shane. As, you know that you gave us that. This is the, that's how we had the, this this bolt here had had uh, a half an inch of slippage in the vertical and the horizontal to be able to do that. Beautiful. It's beautiful, right? It was great, but so we also we had because of our schedule pressures, this concrete, which was doubly curving, was also curing at the time, so it was changing shape, right? Uh, and so we needed to wait for the concrete. We, we either could wait for the concrete to cure. Uh, but we also need to prefabricate the walls, right? So to solve for this, we, we decided we were just gonna, you know, we were gonna spend the money and we were gonna just continuously scan and survey the space, right? So the team, that this, uh, this, this team gathered data in the field and they, they shared it with a fabricator in China to ensure that they were placing the attachment hardware correctly. We round tripped this data to them continuously and as a result, every piece was fabricated correctly, installed on time and we were ultimately able to open on time and everyone did a great job and we all went home. Now. When I presented this project in the past, um, uh, it's usually in the context of like, oh, look how great Turner is. We, we manage this complex process and BIM to field the data, BIM to field the BIM, and how that expertise allows us to provide much more superior value to our customers and so forth and so on. Uh, and it's true, um, we are all those things. Um, but the more important to point today is that industrialized construction has much higher coordination and technical communication requirements that requ than traditional on-site uh, methods. And that, proved, that improved coordination comes at a significant cost, right? There are the obvious monetary costs, right, for the ongoing digital survey and analysis. That was a, a full-time engineer. Um, some of these we mitigated through automa automation. Our team used some computational tools in Rhino to, you know, Rhino and Grasshopper. I think it was actually explicit history still at this point. But uh, to simplify that reality capture data so the wall fabricator could use it more successfully. Um, getting those key points, right? The, the, there's also the, there were also opportunity costs, though, right? We had to devote the full efforts of one of our really great project engineers to manage this process, a completely unique process, meaning she was really unavailable to do anything else for Stanford to improve our business there, right? So because she was devoted to this job and she, and we, you know, she wasn't there to do anything else but that, you know, we're, we're as a company, we're culturally predisposed to efficiency and so there's a really simple conclusion to draw here. The effort involved in industrializing a construction process and researching it, prototyping it, deploying it is unavoidably costly and parasitic to core business delivery, right? As a result, we only innovate when it is necessary for the survival of a project, right? That these projects tend to be spectacular in scope and scale is pretty much irrelevant, right? They remain outliers at the fringe of our business and not really indicative of the <laughs> overall pressures we face as a business, which leads me to my next point, is that industrialization exists today, but it's largely a niche solution. Right? An example, another example of a unique project conditions leading to radical improvements in prefabrication and deep supply chain innovation is happening in some of our data center work, which is a huge, expanding, ex insanely expanding part of our business, as it is for most you know, construction managers and, and head contractors. So we recently had the opportunity to build six data centers in Iowa for a client that shall remain nameless. Um, unfortunately, I can't show you any images, um, uh, but I'll try to describe our prefab experience on, on the electrical rooms there. As a baseline, we built these football field sized, uh, that's American football, sorry, the, uh, the hand egg, right? Is that what we call it here? Um, hand, egg. hand egg, it looks like an egg and you carry it in your hand. It's not, you know, every... So, sure. <laughs> um, uh, so we built these, they're about, uh, about 100 meters long, 50 meters wide. Uh, um, and it took us the better part of three months to build the first one. We built all the nine, nine banks of, of switch gear in situ. Um, and after this experience, our team felt there's, well, there's probably substantial gains to be made from prefabricating here. Um, we were really surprised at how, what kind of gains we actually were able to make, right? So they went away, they worked with the architect, they came up with a, they worked with the electrical contractor and the, and the switchgear manufacturer and came up with a solution. Basically, we skidded all nine of these, these things. They, we shipped them from Texas up to Iowa and we transported them and we, we pulled off a, a part of the wall and just slid them into the building. And as a result, you know, we only did on the second, the second time through, we only, it was only one day of labor on site, 
right? So we, it, it took the electrical room, which was our biggest critical path item, it took it completely off the critical path. And we just completed the room for the third phase of that in less than a day, about, about a morning now is what we're, what we're doing. And we're gonna be just as fast for the next three, right? But again, this improvement was a result of pretty unique conditions, right? This was, we got to do what we rarely get to do here, which is we got to build the same building more than once. We got to build it, uh, we get to build it six times. We're gonna be wildly more profitable and wildly more productive on the last one, right? So one more project here to talk about prefabrication is one of the most unique projects in our company's history, and it was a really great success at, at inventing new prefabrication strategies and you know, developing a common shop strategy, but it was also a colossal failure as a project. Um, which is probably why I'm the only person at Turner that's ever gonna show this project in public, because I like failures, what they teach us about the limits of institutional knowledge, I like the, you know, and how we can learn and be better, and in turn, what those limits can teach us about the future, right? Uh, I'm not sure if this project ever got an official name, so I'll just call it, we called it internally. This is the Google barge. Um, it was a floating showroom for Google Glass. If everyone remembers Google, Google Glass, I think it's coming back now as, as an industrial tool, but it was a little augmented reality thing that people would wear in San Francisco to annoy their neighbors. Um, you know, so we built this, we, we built it establishing, we established a manufacturing facility on Treasure Island, uh, which is in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. Um, you know, it was, and it was set up just to modify and reinforce shipping containers. This whole thing is built out of shipping containers. Um, and so we learned a lot about, one, about building a common shop. We, we, we were able to mobilize uh, all the trades. We built a, a full fabrication facility on, on the island that we hadn't been there before. Uh, we built that in, in a couple of weeks and, and we tweaked it as we went along. Um, but the biggest lesson we learned about this is that, that shipping containers are the, absolutely the worst thing you ever want to build anything out of. Um, but you know, like most of them are, it's a lie, right? There's there's so much st reinforcing structure in there that they're they're no longer shipping containers at all. You're not using any of the structure of the of the shipping container. But for this customer, for Google, it didn't really matter. The spiraling costs and the schedule delays didn't really matter to them because they wanted a Halo project. They wanted this signature project that reflected their brand and their capacity for innovation. Unfortunately, uh, there was just no logical reason that a showroom needed to be on a barge in the middle of the bay, right? So in the one, in once the Coast Guard and the California Coastal Commission figured out what was going on, they shut it down like that. So this is a case where the project conditions were not sufficiently unique to merit this kind of radical departure from our existing methodology of construction and probably will remain an outlier for our business for the foreseeable future. But so nevertheless, if we can industrialize uh, construction, which we've done, uh, if there is no real attractable technical barrier to doing it, if it can be cheaper, faster, safer, uh, if we've done it in the past, then the question remains, right? Why don't we build buildings like cars? Well, the fact is we've tried, right? Uh, uh, time and again, we've attempted as an industry to industrialize construction, and every time we've been left with, at worst, an, amb an ambiguous failure, or at best, a niche solution. So why is that? And I think it has a really obvious answer. They're not cars. Right? Uh, cars are, relatively speaking, small standard objects built from smaller custom parts. On the other hand, buildings are relatively large custom objects assembled from standardized materials. Right? So if we can agree that buildings are not like cars, then can we agree that it's absurd to expect success when we just copy the automotive industry's means of production? Right? Which this gets me to my final point of the day, which is this. Industrialized construction will not resemble any existing process. That is to say, we can't simply transliterate the tools that make the industrial production of cars or phones or beef or whatever uh, and expect them to be successfully adopted. This, I think, is both a blessing and a curse, so let's deal with the curse first. Since it won't look like any other known process, we, as the incumbent industry players, don't have a specific advantage over outside competitors that may have both the agility and the cultural predisposition towards research, iteration, and innovation to deliver, to deliver new and successful approaches to design and construction delivery. And indeed, both tech giants as well as some vertically integrated real estate ventures, one of which you heard about this morning down there, Katera, um, are currently really throwing an immense pool of really patient capital at this problem with an with a, uh, explicit goal of disrupting our industry, transforming our industry, displacing incumbents like us, and reshaping the built environment through the intelligent application of computation and resource allocation. Right? This, to my point of view, is the crux of the sea change that we're right now in the middle of, and it's why this time is different than every other time when we've been asked to change. For the past 10 years, we've been discussing the digitization of the industry, making ourselves, getting ourselves on a data-based uh, delivery process, getting ourselves to digitize and bring everything into a BIM environment. 
But now that we're getting better at digitizing process data, you know, the, the, you know, the next step, I think, is starting to compute on it, right? Um, and when I say that, what I mean is uh, we need to start applying computation to the flows of information, material, and labor, and equipment that are fundamental to our work, right? And research-biased organizations both within and outside our industry are starting to do this already. And I'm going to talk about a couple of examples. This is a, a project we did. This is actually a, a basketball arena in Sacramento that we did. And we worked with a company called Reconstruct. Uh, they have a really interesting set of tech where you can actually fly over the project. We do photogrammetry from a drone. And then they compare it back to a BIM model. We get status of all the, all the objects. The stat, like the, you, know, you can see the green was installed on time. The red was... Uh, not installed on time, um, you know, and so what they're now doing with this platform, the data they're learning from, they're getting from this, they're able to start to learn and compute uh, risk and compute uh, reliability of certain trades in certain regions. Um, it's becoming a really, really interesting source of, of information for us. And that's just one place where we're starting to look at that. There's a lot of other industries, a lot of other uh, companies that are predisposed towards research, like Cat and Caterpillar has a billion dollar research fund. I wish I had a billion dollar research fund. If anyone wants to give me a billion dollar research fund, um, I can give you my card. Uh, uh, you know, th this is a, a self-driving um, uh, 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 loader truck from uh, one of their mining operations, right? I'm sure th these are in operation down here. Um, you know, th again, optimizing the routes at which these things are traveling, saving gas, saving uh, material, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a company that's a little closer to us, uh, a neat startup that's coming out of, uh, out of Boston called Smart Video. Um, and what they're doing is using uh, machine learning and using uh, sort of machine vision to start to, to examine uh, construction site photography and video for safety and, and risk. Um, and it's interesting. They're, they're, they're just at the beginning of this. And what's interesting about it is that, that you know, all this stuff, the machine learning, it's, it's so rapidly commoditizing. Um, I actually had a, a discussion with a friend of mine who works at WeWork. Um, and they've built, and this is amazing, they've, they've, <laughs> they've built a, a neural network that uh, is better at designing the uh, number and size and location of uh, conference rooms in their co-working spaces than a traditional designer, right? So they, they build this up. You can see the prediction by designers and the prediction by computer. Um, you know, again, the, 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 this is being commoditized so fast. They actually built this. It looks fancy and cool and all techy. They built this in Excel. You can build machine learning. You can build a convolutional neural network in Excel, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, so that's the bad news. There's a lot of people coming for us. Um, but the good news is, you know, we're, we're experiencing this unprecedented challenge, yes, and, and this is going to require us to rethink our skills and tools and processes, and it's going to be hard work and, uh, to deliver new value for our customers. And, you know, and, and let's be clear, I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily limit that to our traditional revenue streams of documentation and buildings. There's a lot of different things we can provide, I think, still to our customers. And yes, we're still experiencing a, short, a shortage of skilled labor that we need to, do, need to have to provide that value. But we're also still designers, builders, thinkers, right? So we all, we all kind of have a once in a generation opportunity to design the future of the industry, right? And at the end of the day, we do, I think, still have a positional advantage over these insurgent companies. Collectively, our industry has access to a deep and historical understanding of the domain constraints and the problems we face, right? And I think that gives us a leg up on people who are attempting to reinvent our industry from first principles. Um, so to tie all of this together, prove the point, hopefully, uh, I want to end today with a project that represents what I believe Turner and the industry at whole, uh, as a whole is capable of when we continually strive to expand and improve our practices, leveraging BIM and thinking lean and being lean and innovating up and down the supply chain and applying computational intelligence to the construction of the built environment. Right. This is Rockefeller University uh, in New York City. Uh, it's on the east side of Manhattan Island, right there next to the FDR Drive. This was the traffic on the FDR Drive this morning, actually, or actually it was, it was last, yesterday evening. Um, so the Rockefeller University, uh, it's, you know, their biggest problem, as uh, like many landowners in New York, is they don't have much space. Right? They are penned in by the East River, and then they're penned in by York Avenue over there. And uh, they had really had limited options for how they would expand and improve their facilities to compete with other research universities. Right. One key asset they did have is they had the rights, the air rights, to develop over the FDR. Right. You can see it down here, six-lane highway. Uh, that is, uh, I think, the average daily travel on that highway is about 135,000 cars. 
Um, so the, the only problem with uh, the, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's one of the busiest highways in the, uh, in, in the country. Um, and with Manhattan's um, uh, automotive infrastructure, as you can see, already kind of taxed, all that red is just traffic jams. Um, it was clear we couldn't shut down the drive for any appreciable amount of time, so we had to come up with a different solution. So since we couldn't close the road, we had to come up with this. So collaborating with our structural engineer, Thornton Tomasetti, our steel fabricators and, and erectors, NYC constructors, uh, and our maritime engineer, Don John Marine, uh, we came up with this, the, uh, with this idea that we were going to prefabricate the entire steel structure about 30 miles away in New Jersey, um, uh, barge those sections up the river, and lift them into place over the course of 19 nights. Um, and I don't think I'm overstating it when I say that this required, for us at least, a whole new level of data fidelity, of prefabrication precision, and process predictability. Uh, and all our operations had to be timed so that at 1.30 a.m., when they shut that road down, uh, the team was ready to pivot the structure into place and secure it completely before the road uh, reopened at 4.30. And you know, even uh, this is a, uh, one of the fun anecdotes about this is that, that uh, there was actually one of those nights there was a protest happening where they, the, some protesters took over the FDR drive. And the police actually gave us only an hour and a half. <laughs> you know, it said, you know, they're coming your way. You just got you got to get this done as fast as possible. And, and luckily, we did. Um, but this is one of those rare occasions where everything we've been striving for comes together, and we kind of deliver something that's unprecedented, unprecedented and spectacular. Right. So, in closing, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So here's three million eight hundred sixty-four thousand words about our process at Rockefeller University. And it's not going to play. There we go. <laughs>